This morning, we come to find we come to the head the end of the season after Epiphany in a very traditional way, with the story of the Transfiguration. For some reason, whether whenever I read about Peter, James, and John standing on the mountain with Jesus, I start thinking of my beloved Western South Dakota. Not so far, not so much the East River, as we call South Dakota east of the Missouri River, but West River, the land to the west of the Missouri River. East River, South Dakota, is mostly, mostly a beautiful continuation of Minnesota with miles and miles of Midwestern farmland. West River, however, is a barren branch land which stretches seemingly forever with few interruptions. Some of you old-timers, you old-time Episcopalians, rather, may remember back into the 1990s when Alabama was in companion relationship with South Dakota. Now, before I go on with this story, I need to tell you that I have run it by, I've run it by a couple people to see if it was okay to repeat in the church. They said it was. So here it goes. While Reed and I lived in South Dakota, every couple of years we would drive home to Alabama to be with her parents. When we did, we would often stay a day or two with my good friend Bill King, then the rector of All Saints in Homewood. I remember that we decided to go to church with him on Sunday morning to tie our two churches together in a relationship. The service was going great until they came to the prayers of the people. During those days, it was popular to include the South Dakota cycle of prayers in Alabama and in their prayers at, on Sunday. So the congregation began to slowly go down a list of churches and towns in South Dakota for that particular week. Well, they did a real good job of it until they came to Slim Butte, which they all pronounced out loud as slim butt. Reed and I nearly fell off our pews and laughed. They didn't even blink an eye. Now, many of South Dakotans do pray for slim butts, but I knew that it wasn't what All Saints was collectively praying for that Sunday. At least I don't think so. They just went off on, they just went on as if nothing happened, but I could tell you slim butt, but I couldn't get slim butt off my mind as I giggled to the end of the service, all along the time with Rita jabbing me in my ribs to stop and be quiet. Now I should tell you, if you haven't seen one before, youths are one of God's most majestic and marvelous creations. They just kind of sit out there, miles away from anywhere and anything, a guardian to the plains which stretch out below them, still and silent. Perhaps the most famous butte in all South Dakota jets out from the Black Hills and into the High Plains near Sturgis, South Dakota. You may remember this, that Sturgis, Sturgis is the home of the famous Harley-Davidson motorcycle rally in August. Most of the motorcycle people don't bother traveling over to Bear Butte. But Bear Butte is important and it's unique because it's the holy mountain of the Lakota people. For centuries, the tribes has brought their young men to its summit to experience what is called a vision quest. A vision quest is an initiation, initiating uh, ritual where a boy would become a man. The boy would sit in isolation on the crest of the butte, fasting and waiting until they had a vision of God. When they received their vision, they became a man, and they could go down the mountain to face life. In some ways, Peter, James, and John, climbing to the top of their mountain centuries ago, were on their own vision quest with Jesus. History tells us that there were two traditional places for the transfiguration. One is high on Mount Hermon or Mount Hermon, far to the north of Israel, up in the mountains, surrounded by Syria and Lebanon. And the other is Mount Tabor, which lies like a solitary butte between Galilee and Nazareth. Mount Tabor, like Bear Butte, lies by itself, holy and quiet and isolated. From its flat summit, you can see much of the biblical story unfold before you. 
You can easily see Nazareth just to the west. The Valley of Armageddon, where the Bible prophesies prophecies that prophesies that time will come to an end, stretches majestically just below you. It doesn't take a pair of binoculars to see the track of the ancient King's Road coming up from Egypt as it heads to the north and east to Syria and Persia beyond that. If you look to the if if you look to the east, you can plainly see the Sea of Galilee listening majestically below you. And on the especially clear day, you can even see the Mediterranean Sea on the far, far western horizon. As the disciples gazed out, they could see almost their entire known world. In my imagination, it was on this mountain it's like the tran that the trigger transfiguration happened. For me, there is no doubt. Into this silent, majestic, holy moment, those three disciples would have had would have a magnificent vision which would change their spiritual identity forever. In a way, they were transformed that very moment from boys to men. As they looked up, standing before them in the whiteness, brightest clothing imaginable, imaginable, they saw Jesus along with the central figures of their Jewish faith. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Moses uh, and Elijah yeah. brought them face to face, and Elijah, the prophet, who brought them and called them for justice and mercy. Here they were. We call them transfigured, and no doubt Peter, James, and John were forever changed. In Peter's kind of crazy, spontaneous way of thinking. He knew he had to do something to mark this sacred spot. So he came up with the idea that he would place a marker, a booth, as to what it was, as, as it was called back then, to be a permanent marker to tell the world what he had seen. I guess it was as good as any of idea. Our Bear Butte, on Bear Butte, the young men didn't leave booths when they left, when they, when they would leave when they left, they would leave feathers to, to mark the spot, to mark the spot where they encountered the holy. They understood the desire to leave nothing behind to commemorate what had happened. All as I had thought about it, it came to me that this is a very human thing to do. It's kind of like young lovers on Valentine Day carving their names on a tree for eternity to see. Next, we need to notice that after all they had seen, Peter, James, and John weren't permitted to stay on the Mount Tabor. No, Jesus gently led them back down to the reality of the valley which lay below. Perhaps I thought they couldn't stay on the mountain because of their own journeys were only now set to begin. And because of the transfiguration, they now had built a built-in compass to steer them even though they still made some huge mistakes. We also must come down the mountain from the mountaintop vision quest experience. Like Peter, James, and John, and all those Lakota young men, we also, we are also given a compass to lead us. Not, not that we don't ever sit again, but deep within us, there is a guiding light that guides us. I believe that the holy compass guides us into all truth. Starting this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, we will begin our annual journey through the Valley of Lent. Our mountaintop experience is now behind us. All we have left to go by now is our God-given compass. Our 40 days of Lent are not meant to be merely a time to mourn our sins, which are many, but a time and a moment etched in time to discover once again what we left behind on that majestic holy mountaintop, and then to cast a weary eye on what is ahead. Our Lord does not abandon us even during our purposeful walk through the valley of Lent. No, our Lord walks with us hand in hand, quenching our thirst as we place one foot in front of the other, and as we slowly trod the pilgrim's path before us. 
we once again learn what a gift it is to be both human and a child of God. Our path is the way which leads from the transfiguration through the valley to the crucifixion and ultimately, ultimately brings us to resurrection. I invite each of you to join me as we journey from the Mount of Transfiguration through the Valley of Lent and finally to the pinnacle of Easter and the promise of resurrection. Join me, won't you? Oh, the things we'll discover on the way. I promise you, it will be amazing. Amen and hallelujah.